Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that for over 50 years has been changing lives through God's unconditional love and grace. I can guarantee you, if you make yourself a living sacrifice and present your body to the Lord and say, God, I'll do anything, go anywhere, be anything, I'll be less, I'll be whatever. You do that, God will use you. And now, here's Andrew. Real quickly, let me go back. Last night, I talked about how that even as a little kid, I knew God had a purpose for me. I don't know how I knew it, but I just knew it. And I used to wonder, what's God's purpose? Then as I was graduating from high school, I got to seriously seeking the Lord. And for probably 18 months, my whole focus is, God, what is your purpose for my life? I was beginning college and I had to make decisions and I didn't want to just make decisions and do something because this is what I was told to do. I wanted to know what God's purpose was. So for 18 months, I was seriously seeking God and asking His will. And then in Christmas, in between Christmas and New Year's of 1967, our church youth group always went to Cloudcroft, New Mexico. And we had a time there where during the day we would go tubing and We'd go down to White Sands, New Mexico and go sledding on the sand dunes and do different things. And we would do things during the day. And then at night we'd have a devotion and it wasn't real deep, but it was just a devotion. And, and anyway, during that uh, time, there was a man that read Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. And that says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And those last phrases are what got my attention. I had been seeking and asking God, what's your will? And it said, you do this, you will prove. And he said that the word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses. See, that's what I wanted. I believe God had a will for my life. I just didn't know what it was. So I believed it existed, but I didn't know how to get it manifest. And this said, you do this, you will prove. Make manifest to the physical senses what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And man, that just was like, a bolt of lightning from heaven. It's like, this is what I've been seeking. This is what I wanted to know, to know. And I forget exactly what his purpose was, but I remember when he read that verse, it was like God just struck that into my heart. So that was at Christmas time, 1967. And for four and a half months, all I did was study that scripture and say, God, what is this? What does this mean? And I mean, I just poured over this. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, is when I had my life changing encounter with the Lord. And I mean, he totally revolutionized my life. And often I'll give the testimony about what happened on March the 23rd, 1968, but people don't always you know, get the whole story and the connection but it was me seeking, God, what is your will? And those two verses is what plowed the ground in my heart and made me ready for what God was going to do. So really, that was the whole key to everything. And let me just share with you some of the things that the Lord shared with me out of those verses. And I've got uh, an entire book on this entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. I think we gave that to everybody who registered and is a part of this. And so you, it'll go into a lot more explanation. But here's some of the major things that God shared with me. Dwayne uh, hit this right at the end of his thing that I learned that God's will isn't my vocation and it's not what I do. I forgot the exact wording that uh, Dwayne was sharing, but it's, it's about being a living sacrifice. That was God's will. That's God's will for every one of us is to be a living sacrifice, totally committed unto Him. And then as you renew your mind, you'll prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You'll find vocation. God will lead you into what He wants you to do. 
But God's will for every one of us is to be a living sacrifice, completely submitted unto Him. That's God's will. And then how He uses you is actually secondary. It's immaterial in a sense. Did you know God wants me more than He wants my service? I was raised in a denomination that we had songs about, I was born to serve the Lord. And we talked about sacrificing and how you had to do all of these things. And there is a truth in all of that. But God loves you and me more than He loves what you can do for Him. And our society, I don't, I don't know all the reasons for this, but we are just so performance oriented. We are so goal oriented. It's all about doing something. And, and this is what most people think that finding God's will is all about is God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to be a, a doctor, a lawyer? Do you want me to live here? Do you want me to go do this? Well, that's all a, an outgrowth. That's a result of God's will. But God's will for you is to be a living sacrifice, holy, and surrendered unto Him in every single thing. And if you haven't done that, then if somehow or another you stumble across what His vocation is for you, how He wants to lead you, where He wants you to live, who He wants you to marry, and all of these things, if somehow or another you were to stumble into the things that He's wanting you to do, you'd mess the whole thing up if you aren't a living sacrifice. But on the other hand, you become a living sacrifice. Here's the way the Lord said it to me as I was studying these verses for those four months. The Lord spoke to me and He says, if you become a living sacrifice, if you yield yourself completely to me, He says, you, it would be impossible. You would have to literally backslide and turn your back on me to keep from fulfilling the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's like if you make yourself available, it's like, you know, they build a ship. They don't build a ship to sit and dry dock. You build a ship to put to sea. And if you yield yourself to the, you know, divine shipbuilder, and if he makes you the person that you're supposed to be, I can guarantee you he wants to use you more than you want to be used. If God isn't using you, it's because you aren't usable. So instead of praying, oh God, use me, and oh God, open up a door, and oh God, help me to get this done, what you need to do is just make yourself available and say, God, here am I, and I want to be a living sacrifice. I want to know you. I want to know your will. I want to be the person that you want me to be. As Dwayne was sharing about, man, standing before God, and am I done? Have I done what you want me to do? That ought to be every one of our heart cry. It's not about fame and credit and getting notice and money and all of these kind of things. It's all about knowing God. I used to pray in the beginning, oh God, use me. Oh God, use me. And the Lord told me, he says, the reason I don't use you is because you aren't usable. Never pray, God, use me. Pray, God, make me usable. And I can guarantee you the moment you get usable, God will use you. The moment he can trust but one of the reasons that God hasn't revealed his, you know, his vocation or the other things that are so important in our life, one of the reasons he hadn't revealed those things to you is because he loves you so much that if he was to give you revelation of what it is that he wants you to do, and if he was to open up doors and to push you out there, if you aren't yielded to him, it would destroy you. And he loves you too much. To do that. You know, just take my life. Uh, I was sitting here this morning and I was just worshiping the Lord and praising God and thinking, God, this is awesome. I just love God so much for everything he's done. And I was looking at this as the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in my eyes. And you don't, some of you have heard my testimonies, but you don't appreciate what God has done in my life the way I do. I was so poor, I couldn't pay attention. When Jamie was eight months pregnant, we went two weeks without anything but water, not one piece of food. We were so broke. And to see what God has done is just, 
It's amazing. Man, I got, I totally lost my train of thought. I got to thinking about how blessed I am. <laughs> I forgot where I was going with that, but man, I'm just blessed. I am blessed, blessed, blessed. But anyway, I think I was, it was something along the lines of, it was just impossible. If, oh, here's what it was. God loves me so much that if he would have put me into the position that I'm in right now with the responsibilities and the, all of the things, and if he would have done that for me 20, 30 years ago, if he would have done it for me 10 years ago, it would have destroyed me. Yeah. One of the reasons that God hadn't opened up the door, and don't, don't think it wasn't because I wasn't knocking on the door. Don't think it wasn't because I was not seeking the Lord. Man, I lived decades in frustration because I had, I knew what God's will for my life as far as vocation and what he wanted me to do. And I was so frustrated that it wasn't coming to pass. I mean, it was hard. But one of the reasons God didn't open the doors is because I wasn't ready. I hadn't grown to that place. You know, just in the area, there's multiple areas, but just in the area of finances, man, I struggled with finances. I went decades in this ministry with collection agencies after us constantly. I got to where I, I was the one that would answer the phone because my staff just couldn't handle the people that were coming and telling us some Christian you are can't even pay your bills. And I felt bad for my staff, so I'd take all of those critical calls and had people tell me, say, you know, anyway, it was bad. And uh, we struggled and struggled. And I had a real blockage in the area of finances. And it wasn't because I didn't love God. I just, I don't know all of the reasons for it, but I was taught that, um, you know, having money was a, was a bad thing. That's not the right way to say it. Man, I'm struggling to say this without telling you stuff and minister on finances. But anyway, I had a wrong attitude about finances. And I was struggling. And my vision was bigger than what I could do. And finally, I had this man, Dean Melton, come. And I went to his church for 32 years in a row. And this man amazed me because he lived in a house that he paid $2,500 for. And he had lived there for 50 years, $2,500, 700 square foot house. And it didn't have indoor plumbing. And he had redone it and put indoor plumbing in and stuff. But he still lived in a $2,500 house that he bought. And he didn't take a salary from the church. He had a tire business. He owned about 20 or 30 houses that he had bought and he got rent from them. That's where he made his money. And he gave 90% of everything he owns to the Lord and took no salary from the church, gave away 90%, lived on the 10%. And I saw this man prosper and do things. I mean, I would go to his church and he has less than a hundred people in his church. And I'd go to his church and he'd give me $350,000 for a five day meeting. It was unbelievable. And I saw him operate in prosperity, not for himself, but for the Lord. I always was taught that prosperity was selfish. So anyway, I'm saying all these things to say that, see, I, as long as I had that wrong thinking, God couldn't prosper me. And he wouldn't have put me into this position because it would have killed me. Did you know right now I have to have over $9,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, every day of the week, every day of the year. We have to have a, over $6 million a month just to make our basic needs. If the Lord would have put me in this position and opened up these things that I was begging him for and pleading for, it would have destroyed me. I couldn't have handled it. And yet now it's just amazing. God has grown me and brought me to a place that it's no problem now. And anyway, that pastor Dean Melton came and he taught in our school and I sat down with a yellow pad of paper and I was going to take notes and I listened to him for two days and I didn't write a single note. He didn't say one thing that I didn't know. The difference was he believed it and I didn't believe it. I knew what the scripture said, 
But I had a bad attitude about finances. I thought it was selfish. And man, I did not want to, uh, I did not want something that would turn my heart away from the Lord. You know, the scripture talks about, you know, those who uh, love money, pierce themselves through with many sorrows and, and foolish lusts that drown men in perdition. And I loved the Lord so much, I didn't want that. And anyway, I had to get my thinking straightened out. That was in 1996. And did you know that immediately once I got a revelation, I mean, I sat down and realized I was operating in unbelief and I was letting other people's opinion about finances hold me captive. People criticize ministers. Probably most of you are, you're the fanatics and you're okay with this, but I get a lot of criticism. We've been trashed in the paper here in this area. I had one guy that wrote an article about me and just blasted me on so many levels, but he says he's one of these prosperity preachers. And they came out against me. And you know what? The guy who wrote that article, he just moved into an $850,000 house. I live in a $60,000 house. <laughs> and he lives in an $850,000 house. And I drive a car that was given to me. I didn't buy it. I didn't spend any money on it. I don't know what kind of car he drives. But anyway, he was criticizing me and he couldn't find anything to criticize me over. So he criticized me that Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis are my friends. And so he came out and talked about them and their planes and criticized me over what they've done. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying that there's this attitude about finances that hinders ministers from really standing up and speaking the word and stuff because you're going to be criticized for it. And God showed me that he was looking for somebody who would stand and suffer the persecution that it takes to believe in prosperity. See, God had big plans for my life and I knew it was bigger than where I was, but until I got some things straightened out, it would have killed me if God would have put this much responsibility on me. It would have killed me. And brothers and sisters, it's the same with you. God loves you more than he loves what you can do for him. God wants you, not just what you can do for him. A lot of people, honestly, it's kind of like when you stick a straw into one of these cups and you just, you know, suck on it until you hear at the end and then you throw that away and go get another one. This is what most people think God is. God is just out to do these things and he's going to use you up and just waste you and then throw you to the side and he'll go get somebody else. That's not the way that God is. God is more concerned about you than he is what you can do for him. And if he ever gets your heart, I can guarantee you, he will get your service. You don't have... When you're sitting there trying to coerce people and like, you know, Dwayne made reference to how our president is shaming people into trying to get a vaccine and wear a mask and doing all of these kind of things. God isn't like that. God is not going to force you to do anything. God loves you. And God wants you to voluntarily do it. Matter of fact, there's so many scriptures. First uh, Corinthians 13, 3, if you give all of your goods to feed the poor or if you give your body to be burned and don't do it motivated by love, it profits you nothing. God is more concerned about your heart attitude than he is about your service and about you going and accomplishing certain things. He wants you. So that's the reason that in Romans 12, 1 and 2, he said, first of all, by the mercies of God. This goes to what Dwayne was saying, that God's not going to do make you do something that you hate. He'll change your heart if he wants you to go live in Africa. It'll be, you'll love it. We got a lady, Dottie Hammond, who came to our school and graduated. And this woman is so country, she makes me look posh. That's hard to do. <laughs> when this woman came to school, she brought me a five... A gallon jar of pickled venison that she had killed herself. <laughs> she lived in West Virginia and she would take her gun and knife and be gone for two and three days. This is how she fed her family. And she came here and anyway, on her missions trip, she went to Kenya and just fell in love with it. And she went back 
to Kenya. This has been 15, could have been even more than 15 years ago with $500. The person who brought her there turned out was a crook and he took 400 of it. She had $100 and she went to Bagoma, Kenya and has been there for 15, 16 years, has never come home. And she now has 15 adopted kids. She feeds over 200 widows. She takes care of them and she's never come home, uh, has never come back to see her kids and her grandkids. She loves Kenya. That's, and she says, this is where I'm going to live. It's where I'm going to die. And she has just totally given herself to it. You ought to go check out her testimony on our website. It is absolutely awesome. And she owns her house, a hundred thousand dollar house. And she's done all of this stuff and went there with, with nothing. And she loves it. She says she is the most blessed person on the planet. And some of you think, oh, that's terrible. No, if God wants you to do it, you'll love it. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the mercies of God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God's plans for your life will fulfill you and make you happy and complete more than anything you have ever wanted to do in your life. You were designed, everything about you is designed by God for a purpose. And it's only when you find that, that you are going to find that sweet spot that you're in. You know, I've had so many people come to me and right now I'm just living in a situation where God's blessings are just coming upon me and overtaking me. And I've had people ask, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. It's just God's blessing. And I've been walking with him for over uh, five decades and it builds up momentum and I'm just seeing things happen. I'm just where God wants me to be. And there is a supernatural flow when you get there. You know, in the beginning, I pastored three little churches because it's all I could do. I, there wasn't anything, in, there wasn't any other way that I could minister. And I pastored three little churches just because I had a, fire burning in my heart. I wasn't called a pastor, but it was the only way I could minister. And so I did that for six years. And then we came to, I, I went on radio, which was a uh, major deal that God led me to do. And then the very first time I went and ever held an independent meeting after leaving those three little churches that I'd pastored. And I held the very first service in Colorado Springs at the Sheridan Inn up at Academy and I-25 that first night was amazing. I remember when we went back to the hotel, I was in tears telling Jamie, What's, what is this? I said, this is awesome because I was in where I was supposed to be. Bible school for me was pastoring three churches. <laughs> Pity the people that were in my <laughs> church. It wasn't for them. It was for me. I learned a lot pastor in three little churches. But when I started doing what I'm doing now, it's just like there was a special anointing that came on me. When you are where God wants you to be, there is a supernatural flow, a divine flow that you can't accomplish just through your own strength and your own power. So by the mercies of God, because this is best for you, you will love it more. You need to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And I'm telling you, you can't sacrifice yourself. You can crawl up on the altar, but God's fire has to come. So see, this is what I went through for four and a half months. I was meditating on these scriptures. God, what is a living sacrifice? What does this mean? And I longed for it. And I said, God, help me. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to do this. And four and a half months of praying that, and then I had this experience, March the 23rd, 1968, where I mean God showed up. And I hadn't got the words to describe to you, but I saw the glory of God. I saw His holiness, and I saw my relative unworthiness. And it was the fact that I was a religious Pharisee. I was trusting in my goodness and you'll probably take this in the wrong way, but I, honestly, I was the best person I knew. <laughs> I lived holier than anybody I knew. 
I've never said a cuss word in all my life, never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette. I mean, I was living as holy as I possibly could and I was proud of it. And I was trusting in my goodness and thinking, God, look at all I'm doing. How come you haven't done more for me? But when I saw the glory of God, my relative unworthiness to God, you know, it says we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God. And if you ever see the glory of God, I guarantee you, you're going to repent of all of your self-righteousness and stuff. Those of you who still think you're awesome, it's because you're comparing yourself with me or with somebody else. If you ever get a vision of God, I guarantee you, you'll lose your self-righteousness and your self-promotion. And when, I, when the Lord showed up and showed me all of that, man, I repented. I spent two hours or an hour and a half or two hours in front of the leaders of the church, in front of my best friends, repenting and asking God to forgive me. And you know what that was? That was when I became a living sacrifice. I'd prayed and asked, but God showed up. And it's a living sacrifice. It's not just a one-time deal. It's not like March the 23rd, 1968, I sacrificed myself and my ambition and everything to God and that was it and I've never had another problem. Man, it's a living sacrifice. It's something you have to live every single day of your life. But you have to crawl up on the altar. You have to begin the process. You need to recognize that this is God's will. And what good would it do you to find out his direction, his vocation for your life if you aren't yielded to him? You'd blow the whole thing. Yeah. Amen. If I wasn't yielded to God, if God hadn't have done some things in my life, I guarantee you to give me the influence and the position and the things that he's given me now. And if my heart wasn't right, I'd ruin the whole thing. Amen. And this is what's happened with so many ministers for whatever reason. They like Dwayne was saying, you know, he was still a teacher before he even got right with the Lord. He, he had this gift of t teaching on his life. There are people that are musicians and people that are ministers, communicators. And so they may tap into that. And because of the anointing on their life, they can build a ministry. But if you don't have the character, you're going to destroy the whole thing. And we've seen this with people who wind up going out and committing adultery and stealing money and and doing all kinds of things, and it's brought shame on the gospel and stuff. I'm telling you, God is after you, not after what He can do through you. He loves you. And if you haven't actually yielded your life to Him to the point that you're a sacrifice, then that's the first step. That's God's will for your life. And if you do that, and do it over a period of time. He will begin to mold you and make you into the person that he wants you to be. And then finding the direction and how he wants to use you and what he wants to do through you, that's immaterial. It's secondary. God's will is for you to be a living sacrifice. Andrew's teaching titled, How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will, is available in a book for a gift of any amount. The full series is available in three individual teachings, How to Find God's Will, How to Follow God's Will, and How to Fulfill God's Will. Each series is available in a DVD album made from our daily television broadcast, or in a CD or DVD album recorded live at a ministry event. These teachings are also found in three comprehensive study guides. Each resource is yours for a gift of any amount when you write or call. You can order resources through our website at awmi.net. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Last year, in the very beginning of the year, a friend of mine, John Donnelly over in um, Scotland, 
he, he had been praying for me and he says, God has given you the choice that he gave Samson or not Samson, Solomon, excuse me. He gave Solomon about, you know, ask for anything. And he says, you know, I don't even know how to go out or come in. I'm a child and I, I want you to give me wisdom. And John told me, he says, he's given you that choice. And so, you know, what? I thought, well, man, that's awesome. And so I spent two or three months praying about it. I didn't want to ruin my choice. I didn't want to waste it on something else. And I spent two or three months praying about things. And man, there's so much stuff. I need hundreds of millions of dollars. I need a lot of stuff. And I thought about a lot of things. But you know, one day I was praying about this. It was about three months later. And I was walking out the door and saying, God, I just, what is it that I really want more than anything else? And I just said, you know what I want more than anything else is to know you. Who are you? And help me to know you and to make you known. And as soon as I said that, I said, you know what? That's it. If I know him, I'll get all of the money. I'll, I'll get everything that I need. And I just decided that's it. And so I made that my official request. And see, this is, this is all goes back to Romans 12. 1. This is what it's all about. It's just knowing God. It's being a sacrifice. I can't relate to people that say, well, God is telling me to do this, but I can't. I don't even go there. It's been 53 years since I said, God, here's what you want me to do, but here's what I want to do. And again, some of you may misunderstand what I'm saying, but honestly, I ran up a white flag March the 23rd, 1968. I gave everything I had to God. I hadn't got anything left to give. And if he was to tell me to do anything, I've said this often, that if he was to tell me that I was supposed to go to Africa and turn this over to somebody else, I'd walk away from it in a heartbeat. I really would. And some of you may think, oh, I'm not sure you'd do that. I would. There is no reservation. I've been living for 53 years as a living sacrifice. Now, I have not saying that I've done it perfectly. And here's another thing you need to learn is that the reason it's a living sacrifice is because it keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> it's not like you just do this and it's perfect from that time on. God can't deal with all of the junk that's on the inside of you all at once. You couldn't stand it. If God was to show you everything in you that needs to be changed right now and just give you a whole picture of it, you would despair of ever uh, getting to a place that God could use you. He'll just deal with you one thing at a time. And you'll find that there's things in your life that are wrong that you didn't even realize that you were wrong. You know, one time I had been on Bob Tilton's television program. I don't know how many of you know Bob Tilton and stuff, but uh, anyway... I was on his television program and that's back when I was only on radio. Nobody knew what I looked like. And so I went and visited his church a year later or something like that. And there was 2000 people in the church and I was sitting in that church service thinking about, I bet you a lot of these people listen to me on the radio and I bet you I've been able to, uh, God's used me to touch their life. And I was just sitting there thinking, I wonder if anybody knows who I am. I wonder if anybody knows that I'm the one that God used. You know what that is? That's pride. That's arrogance. And I, I made a commitment not to be that way, March the 23rd, 1968, but it'll just sneak up on you sometimes. <laughs> I've had people before say, could you cast selfishness and pride out of me? I can't cast it out. That's your human nature. The only way you can get rid of that is for me to kill you. And then you'll pass on to this other realm and you won't have any of that. But as long as you're breathing, you're going to have selfish thoughts. Things are going to come. It didn't mean that I didn't make a commitment to the Lord. It just means that it's something you have to live constantly. It's a living sacrifice. And anyway, I was sitting there thinking this and, a, and the Lord just smoked me <laughs> about there you go again. There's that old flesh rising up thinking about yourself. Does anybody know who you are? And man, he was dealing with me and I was repenting in my heart. And right at that moment, Bob Tilton said, we are blessed to have Andrew Womack with us. Stand up, Andrew. And I felt like I was naked 
in front of 2,000. But here was God exposing me about my wrong attitudes. And at that exact moment when Bob Tilton had me stand up. And so my point is then I made a commitment. But you know what? The flesh is still there. And you just, you, I heard a man one time say that I died to my flesh 20 years ago. And I've, he says, I've never been in the flesh since. And the moment he said that, I just wrote Ichabod over him. <laughs> the glory has departed. That is not true. You have to deal with this flesh, but there has to be a starting place. When I say that I died to myself and I crawled up on the altar and became a living sacrifice, March the 23rd, 1968, that's when this process began. And I mean, I meant it with all of my heart. But I've had to deal with my flesh, as you will. But I tell you, something significant happened. And I just, like I was saying, I can't relate to people who say, well, God tell, told me to do this, but... If, I, if you can convince me that it's God telling me to do it, I'll do it. And there aren't any restrictions on that. If you are still debating whether you'll do what God told you to do, you aren't a living sacrifice. You've never died to yourself. You're still alive. You're still calling shots. You're sitting on the throne of your life. That's not the way God called us to be. The first step in finding your vocation and all of these other things is that you need to quit being God. You need to bow the knee. Jeremiah 10, 23, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. God has given you a free will, a free choice. He's not going to force you to do anything, but the right choice is to say, God, I'm not smart enough to run my life. And so I crawl up on the altar. I make myself a living sacrifice. And God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll be anything. I'll be less. I don't have to be the main singer. I'll, I'll be in the support role. I'll do anything. Until you literally sacrifice all of your own selfish ambitions, you aren't going to see God really use you the way that He wants to because He can't trust you. He puts you up on the stage and you're liable to preach your own message. You're liable to say your own thing, do your own things. But if He can get you to where you have yielded to Him and you literally have just died to your own self and God, whatever you want, that's fine. That's when God is going to really start revealing Himself to you and that's when things begin. So I'm going to be talking in the other sessions about other ways how that you can get specific direction about how to do things. But really, nothing else matters until you get this established. This is like if you had a ladder that went up to this roof. You don't jump from where you are up to the top rung on the ladder. You start with that bottom rung. You have to take it step by step. And this is the very first step. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but if this is a typical group, the vast majority of us have never become a living sacrifice. It's not even on our radar, much less making a commitment and just being in process and maybe not doing too well. But I would say that the average Christian has never even really seen this. As This is just for you people that are full-time ministers. But man, your life is your own. You'll watch what you want to. You'll listen to the music that you want to. You will make decisions that you want to. You'll decide what you want to do and ask God to bless it. That's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice isn't giving any directions. You aren't calling the shots. When I made that decision within... I'd say within, a, well, nearly immediately, I lost my desire for everything else but God. And I was in college and I just lost my desire to be in college. And so I just said off the top of my head, I'm going to quit school. And boy, did I get in trouble. My mother didn't talk to me for two weeks. I was threatened to be kicked out of my church. They said, you can't be a Christian and say that God would tell you to quit school, not get an education. 
I was going to lose money from the government and just a lot of things happened. And so I wavered on it for a while. And then John four, uh, Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And um, I made a decision. I've got to decide this. I may talk about that later because this is one of the ways that you uh, learn the voice of God and how to hear his voice. But I made a decision. And so I finally decided to quit. And it cost me $350 a month. It cost me the acceptance of just about every person I knew. And it gave me an all expense paid trip to Vietnam. And I mean, literally, I could have died. And I was content. If this is what God wants for me, I was fine. I remember being in Vietnam and people all around me dying and it looked like I was going to die. You could see the muzzle fire from the weapons of people coming up the hill. And you know what? Because I had become a living sacrifice and I was just so in love with the Lord. I know some of you are going to think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> but I, I, people dying around me and all of this and I was just so excited. I was thinking, God, this is awesome. I could be in heaven before the night's over. And I was feeling so much love and joy and peace. And I felt compassion for the Vietnamese that I was firing my weapon at. And thinking, God, I know where I'm going, but if they die. And I was praying for them and asking God to bless these people that we were trying to kill. I know it's weird, but I'm telling you, I just literally put my life on the line and I haven't done it perfectly. I've messed up, but I have never, ever had to go back and say, oh God, I didn't mean it back in 68. No, I meant it with all of my heart because I'm flesh. I fail to be the person I'm supposed to be. And there's times that I have to deal with it and get up, but I have never, ever, ever gone back on that commitment. That is my heart's desire. And I'm telling you, if you aren't there, if you are still running your life, if you are the one in control, then this is the first step for you. You don't need to go any further than this. You got to start with this bottom rung on the ladder and climb up. And so I'm asking you today to make that decision. This, you may think, well, I wanted to know God's vocation. Again, that's automatic nearly. It's byproduct of knowing God. I can guarantee you, if you make yourself a living sacrifice and present your body to the Lord and say, God, I'll do anything, go anywhere, be anything. I'll be less. I'll be whatever. You do that, God will use you. you it would be, you'd have to backslide on God to keep from fulfilling His will for your life. And I'm proof of it. I'm proof. God has done things in my life that Man, it's just God. Right before my mother died in 1999, she was 96 years old. And she was having me tell her about all the things. She worked for me for about 15 years or so. And she just loved what God was doing in our life. And I told her about all of these things. And she looked at me and she said, Andy, you know this is God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know this is God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> And I said, amen, it's true. I can guarantee you this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Billy introduced me this last Tuesday and he says, Andrew has never been the smartest man in the room. <laughs> That's what Billy said when he got up here. Or no, excuse me, that was Paul Milligan. I, I, I spoke wrong, it was Paul Milligan, our former CEO. He said that... <laughs> That's not the reason he's the farmer. <laughs> but he said, Andrew's never been the smartest man in the room. And it's true. I tell you, the only thing I got to my credit is that I know God and God knows me and I love God. And God has done things in my life that are so far beyond me. I ought to be a sermon, a encouragement to every one of you that think, how could God ever use me? God chose the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are not, to bring to not things that are so that no flesh would glory in his presence. I'm telling you, what God is looking for is a surrendered vessel, not a silver vessel. 
If he can get your heart, he'll have everything else. And yet many of us have been substituting, God, I'll give you my service. God, I'll give you money. God, I'll do this. But what he wants is you. He wants you. And I'm just asking you today, this is the first step in finding God's will for your life is to recognize that God's will is for you to be a living sacrifice. That's for every one of us. Now he's going to lead some people into being lawyers or bankers or preachers or whatever, but every one of us, God's will is for you to be a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice where it's continual. Right now for the rest of your life, every day of your life, God, I want your will above my will. I want to know you more than I want anything you could give me. That's what God wants out of every one of us. And so I'm asking you today to make that commitment. And some of you may think, well, man, I'm not sure I'm ready. Well, you could at least say, I want to be ready. I want to become a living sacrifice. Just like with me, I saw those verses and for four and a half months, I prayed and said, oh God, what's a living sacrifice? Help me. And it took me four and a half months, but I guarantee you, God showed up. God wants relationship with you more than you want relationship with him. And if you will make this the desire of your heart and begin to move in that direction, I guarantee you whatever it is that he needs to deal with to make it come to pass, he will do it. But you have to make the commitment. God is not going to force this on you. I have no way of knowing how many people have literally made a commitment to where they just give God everything they've got. But I believe it's a very, very small percentage. The vast majority of Christians, they've cried out for salvation so that they won't go to hell. They've asked God to forgive him. They may serve him and do some things for him. But to say that he has their heart and that he literally could command them to do anything and they'd be willing to do it, there's not very many people like that. And so it's not because he doesn't love you and doesn't want it, but he just won't force it on you. This is something that you have to do. You have to make yourself a living sacrifice. You have to crawl up on the altar. And if you'll do that, God will wait until he sees that your heart is really sincere in it. And then when you seek with all of your heart, I guarantee you the fire of God will fall and he'll burn up that old flesh. And he'll take care of stuff. And, and it'll begin you on a, it'll put you on a path that I guarantee you, you'll look back and say, it's never going to be the same. I believe that for many of you, today is what, the 17th of September, is that correct? Yep. Many of you could be referring back to September the 17th, 2021, is when I crawled up on that altar and I became a living sacrifice. And you'll be able to, if the Lord tarries 50 years from now, look back and talk about, man, what a ride it's been. But you have to start the process. You know, there's one last thing I want to share with you. I had Jim Irwin, who was one of the astronauts that landed on the moon. And I did some television programs with him. And he signed his books and gave them to me. And I signed my books and gave them to him. And anyway, I just started pumping him for all this information because in 69, when they landed on the moons, when I was in the army and we, I was in basic training. I didn't see any of it. I missed out on it. I heard about it, but I never saw it. So I was interested. I wanted to learn things, you know, like how do you go to the bathroom in weightlessness? <laughs> things that you probably won't hear. And Jim Irwin told me he never did figure it out. He said, <laughs> It was not good. But anyway, <laughs> I started asking him questions and I had this thought that they, the technology was so awesome that they just flew that thing towards the moon. It landed and I was just so impressed. Did you know I've heard since then that your cell phone has something like a hundred or a thousand times the computing power of the lunar module. I mean, it was primitive what they did. And Jim started sharing with me that they just blasted off and then they threw the capsule towards the moon. 
And every 10 minutes for four days, they had a course correction. And he said, sometimes the moon would be that direction and they'd be going 90 degrees opposite to the moon. And they'd have to have a burn to come back on. Other times it was just a fraction off. But the truth was they went to the moon like this. <laughs> they didn't do it perfectly. And then they had a 500 mile landing strip that they had planned to land in. And he says, when they landed and got out of the lunar module and put foot on the moon, they were within five feet of being outside of this 500 mile landing zone. They nearly missed a 500 mile runway. <laughs> and yet they got there. And as he was telling me this, the Lord just spoke to me and he says, that's the way it is with becoming a living sacrifice. You don't just say, all right, I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to make Jesus Lord. I'm becoming a sacrifice. You don't do that and then just perfectly do it the rest of your life. You head in that direction. And then there's a course correction every 10 minutes for the rest of your life. <laughs> And it doesn't mean that you didn't blast off and start, but it just means that God can't deal with everything all at once. He'll just deal with things. Some of you, by the time you get out of this service, you're going to go out there and if they have the gelato truck there, uh, somebody else will be in line in front of you and get the last thing that you wanted and you've got an opportunity for a course correction. <laughs> Somebody's going to pull out in front of you and you're going to say, why are they driving so slow and stuff? You've got an opportunity for a course correction. God will be correcting you the rest of your life. But it doesn't mean that you didn't start. It just means that you don't do it perfectly, but you do have to blast off. Some of you have never blasted off. Some of you are, didn't even know that you were supposed to blast off. You didn't even know that there was a launching pad. Some of you feel 100% justified in promoting yourself. And look what they said about me. How dare them say that about me? What makes you so important? You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to recognize that there's somebody, God and other people that are more important than you and you aren't that big of a deal. And you'll be having course corrections the rest of your life on this. I want to let you know that we now have a Truth and Liberty live call-in show every weekday. And you can tune in from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time. And we are going to be discussing not only spiritual things, but political things, just anything. It's a live call-in. You will actually get put on the air and we will interact with you. And I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. So remember that's every weekday from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. for our Truth and Liberty live call-in show. Andrew has many conferences and seminars around the globe each year. For the latest information on Andrew's complete speaking schedule, visit our website at awmi.net slash events. Did you hear about our website? We designed it with you in mind. Now you can browse on all your mobile devices. Everything is where you would expect it to be. And if you can't find something, the search bar will. It's fast, easy, and it just makes sense. Check it out at awmi.net. Our Caris Bible College, I believe, is second to none as far as the spiritual material that's being put out and the impact that's being made on students. But did you know our facilities are wanting? We actually had over 550 students that couldn't come this year because they didn't have housing. We need to start providing housing, activity center, cafeteria, all kinds of things. And in order to do that, I need a lot of new partners. I ask you to go to awmi.net slash campus and check it out and become a partner with Karis Bible College today. Did you know that we have over 200,000 hours of free material on our website? I mean, you if you were to watch every single day for eight hours a day, it would take you over 22 years to go through all of that. And it's free. We do have some things for sale, but we have a great website. I encourage you to check it out, awmi.net. We've got television programs, radio programs. We've got videos. We've got teaching. We've got books on there. 
just all kinds of things. Check it out, awmi.net. GospelTruth.tv provides free, 24-7 access to biblical teaching you can trust. Our Grace and Faith channel features teaching from Andrew Womack and other ministers he's personally invited to share with you. Watch daily live programming, including Bible studies and the Truth and Liberty Coalition, as well as conferences, miraculous testimonies, life-changing stories, and financial breakthroughs. Start watching for free today. Visit gospeltruth.tv for biblical teaching you can trust. Thank you for watching the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. We hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. You can get the products on today's teaching as well as many other valuable resources when you visit our website at awmi.net. For over 20 years, Karis Bible College has been training and empowering students to know who they are in Christ and step into their God-given calling and purpose. Not only do we have our main campus in Woodland Park, Colorado, we also have extension schools in several locations all around the world. You can also participate in Keras Online through our distance education courses. If you're interested in attending Keras Bible College, visit kerasbiblecollege.org to find a campus near you to discover all the ways you can attend Keras Bible College. I want to thank you for watching our weekend program of the Gospel Truth and let you know that we have a ministry that I'm on television five days a week. I've been doing that for over 20 years. We have offices, 19 offices around the world. We have Bible colleges located all around the world and just a lot of things that God is doing through this ministry. We would love for you to be a part of it. I encourage you to go check it out at awmi.net and you can join with us and become a partner today. Andrew Womack Ministries has several offices in Karis Bible College locations around the world. To find a location near you, visit our website at awmi.net and click Contact Us. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I want to let you know that when you support Andrew Womack Ministries, that we also support a lot of other ministries. We actually started the Springs Rescue Mission that is now the largest distributor of food and clothing and furniture in all of Colorado Springs. We've got ministries to orphans. We've got ministry to children that have been caught in the sex trade. Uh, we support uh, pregnancy centers. They've actually lowered the abortion rate in Colorado to one of the lowest in the nation. And there's just a lot of things we do. So when you support here, you are helping us reach people all over the world.